Number three, Anna Trujillo. Alf Anderson, who went by his middle name, Stefan, was born in Sweden, and in 1986, he moved to the United States. Ten years later, he became a permanent citizen. Anderson worked as a biochemist and researcher at the University of Houston. The school said his work, quote, influenced several topics, including women's reproductive health, benign prostatic hyperplasia, and prostate cancer, unquote. To friends and family, Anderson was a stand-up guy who was always willing to help. However, Anderson had problems with alcohol. The university sent him to rehab in 2010, and for a while, he was sober. But then, in 2012, he relapsed. He then met Anna Trujillo, who he started dating. Anderson was 59, and Trujillo was 44. Trujillo was born in Mexico and grew up in Arizona. She worked as a massage therapist and an artist and was twice divorced. Like Anderson, Trujillo had problems with alcohol. She was arrested for driving under the influence in 2008 and again in 2010. Over the months, their relationship became strained. On June 9, 2013, Anderson and Trujillo had been drinking all day. They spent the night at a bar in Houston. Then they took a cab home. The driver thought that Trujillo was belligerent towards her boyfriend. The couple returned to their luxury apartment around 2 a.m. Shortly after arriving home, Trujillo attacked 59-year-old Stefan Anderson with the heels of her 5.5-inch stilettos, stabbing him 25 times in the head. Afterward, Trujillo called 911. She cried as she told the dispatcher that Anderson started beating her up and she wasn't able to escape. The police arrived at the couple's apartment to find Anderson bleeding to death. He was rushed to the hospital where he was later pronounced dead. Ashton Bowie, the responding officer, initially thought that Anderson had been shot due to the large amount of blood. It turned out that the heels contained a 5-inch steel rod and these caused serious damage. Bowie took note of Trujillo's strange behavior. He later told the Associated Press, quote, she was sobbing, but no tears were coming down her face, unquote. During a recorded police interrogation, Trujillo told the police that Anderson was mentally abusive. She told them that she had become his caretaker and she was no longer attracted to her older boyfriend. According to her, it was like sleeping with her grandfather. Trujillo claimed that night they argued because Anderson was jealous that another man had bought a drink for her. He feared that she was going to leave him. Trujillo told the police, quote, his face got red and he became infuriated and then he came toward me and said, you're not going to leave me ever, unquote. Trujillo said that the argument became physical and Anderson got on top of her. She claimed she broke free and attacked Anderson with her blue suede stilettos. The police didn't believe Trujillo's version of events. She was arrested and charged with murder. During Anna Trujillo's April 2014 trial, prosecutors argued that she attacked Anderson, who was merely defending himself. Trujillo had no injuries, but Anderson had defensive wounds on his hands and wrists. Trujillo's lawyer argued that Anderson was mentally abusive and she acted in self-defense. Trujillo took the stand, a move even her lawyer didn't recommend. On the stand, Trujillo ranted for almost four hours. Her testimony consisted of allegations of past abuse by former boyfriends. She told the court how her ex-boyfriend sexually abused her and how her boyfriend kicked her while she was pregnant, causing her to miscarry. Trujillo even reenacted the physical fight she supposedly had with Anderson with her attorney. Trujillo's strange performance did more harm than good. The trial lasted about a week. The jury deliberated for four hours. During their deliberations, the jury looked at the stiletto heel, which was covered with the victim's blood and hair. They found Anna Trujillo guilty of murder. During the sentencing phase, 19 people testified. Anderson's family members traveled from Sweden to testify. 
His niece was 110% sure her uncle was never violent with Trujillo. In an interview with Inside Edition, Anderson's ex-wife, Jackie Swift, said her ex-husband was never abusive. She said, quote, Stefan was never verbally, physically abusive to me. If anything, he instilled confidence in me and uplifted me. He supports me in so many ways. It wasn't in his nature to be demeaning, unquote. The prosecution also had witnesses testify against Trujillo. The witnesses recounted stories involving Trujillo's drunken and violent tendencies. One of her ex-boyfriends talked about an incident where she bit him. A former neighbor talked about coming home to find Trujillo using his bathroom. In the closing statements, the prosecution asked for the maximum sentence. They argued that not only did Trujillo kill an innocent man, but she also tried to ruin his reputation by claiming he was abusive. Trujillo expressed remorse before the judge sentenced her. She told the court, quote, I never meant to hurt him. It was never my intent. I loved him. I wanted to get away. I never wanted to kill him, unquote. On April 11, 2014, Anna Trujillo silently cried as the judge sentenced her to life in prison. At the end of the trial, Trujillo's family approached Anderson's family and apologized. Trujillo's mother said, quote, I'm just sorry for the family of Stephen Anderson. I'm truly sorry, unquote. The families cried and hugged. Andrew Hilo will not be eligible for parole until 2042. She'll be 75 years old. 54-year-old Anna Trujillo is currently serving her sentence at the Patrick L. O'Daniel Unit in Gatesville, Texas. Number 2. Els Clotes Mons Els Van Doren was married and had two children. She worked with her husband at their family jewelry store. Van Doren was a member of a skydiving club close to Antwerp, Belgium. She spent most of her weekends there. She was an experienced diver, having performed more than 2,000 dives. In 2004, she met Alice Claudesmans, who had joined the club. Claudesmans was an elementary school teacher. Van Doren and Claudesmans became close friends. Since they both had the same first name, they called Claudesmans Babs to avoid confusion. During their time with the skydiving club, both women had separate affairs with one of the instructors, Marcel Summers. He started having an affair with Van Doren and then began having one with Claudesmans. Summers spent Friday nights with Claudesmans and Saturday nights with Van Doren. On November 18, 2006, a four-person crew, including Els Van Doren, Els Claudesmans, Marcel Summers, and a fourth member, intended to make a star formation after jumping from the plane. Van Doren, Summers, and the fourth member jumped together. Claudesmans hesitated and then jumped. The team managed to make the star formation. Then the team separated to pull their chutes. Van Doren's didn't open. She tried opening her reserve chute, but it also didn't open. The team watched in horror as Van Doren fell 13,000 feet. Els Van Doren landed in a suburban garden in the village of Albatnik, dying on impact. The mother, too, was 38 years old. Van Doren's helmet camera captured the fall, but it cut off when she hit the ground. The police investigated Van Doren's death. The pilot said that Van Doren did everything she needed and it was odd that both chutes didn't open. The police discovered that the parachute had been tampered with. They believed that Els Claudesmans was the one who did it. A week before Van Doren died, she, Claudesmans, and Marcel Summers were in the clubhouse. Summers was in a sexual relationship with both women, but he took Van Doren to bed with him that night and Claudesmans most likely heard them having sex so she may have been jealous. Also, that night, Claudesmond had access to Van Doren's parachute. She would have also known how to sabotage it. The police questioned Claudesmond's, and she denied doing anything to Van Doren's parachute. She claimed that they were close friends. The police let her go home after she was questioned. The police planned on interviewing her again, but before they could, she attempted suicide. 
This only made the police more suspicious. The police dug into her past and they discovered in 2005 that Claudius Mann had harassed both Van Doren's husband and Marcel Summers. She used to have Van Doren's husband anonymous letters they called Summers repeatedly. She had also attempted suicide around this time. The police arrested Els Claudius Mons in January 2007. She maintained her innocence, even pleading her case to the Belgian media. She wrote in a letter published in the Belgian papers, quote, I always knew I was number two for Marcel, unquote. Els Claudius Mons went to trial in September 2010. The defense team argued that there was no physical evidence that tied Claudius Mons to Van Doren's unfortunate death. They suggest that Summers or Van Doren's husband could have tampered with the parachute. The problem was that neither had a motive. Van Doren's husband didn't know about the affair until after her death. Also, Summers was still enjoying his sexual relationship with Van Doren. Summers publicly regretted his involvement with Klaus Mons. He called Van Doren the love of his life. The prosecution argued that Claudius Mons was motivated by jealousy to kill Van Doren. As she heard Van Doren and Summers making love in the next room, she grew homicidal. The prosecution presented her as unstable, but she had the technical know-how to cut the main and reserve shoots. A court psychiatrist had examined Claudius Mons and he testified that she was psychotic, narcissistic, and manipulative. During the trial, the jury watched the complete footage of Van Doren's fall. In October 2010, the jury agreed with the prosecution's arguments and found Claude Mons guilty of murder. The trial gripped the country of Belgium. The media dubbed it the Parachute Murder. On October 21, 2010, Els Claude Mons was sentenced to 30 years of prison. Claude Mons was almost sentenced to life in prison but two circumstances worked for her. Her young age and mental instability kept her out of prison for life. Klaus Vaughn appealed in March 2011, arguing that the police questioned her for more than 100 hours without a lawyer present. The court denied her appeal. In October 2021, 11 years after being convicted, she was allowed to leave prison for the day for a training course. The following year, she was released from prison, but was fitted with an electronic bracelet. She was also allowed to work during the day, and the court placed certain conditions on when and where she could travel. Seventeen years after Els Van Doren's death, Els Claude Mons has never admitted to the murder. Number 1. Gilbert Paul Jordan Gilbert Paul Jordan was born Gilbert Paul Elsie in Vancouver, British Columbia on December 12, 1931. In 1965, he legally changed his name to Gilbert Jordan, so we'll refer to him by that name for simplicity's sake. Jordan dropped out of school in the 7th grade. By age 16, he was abusing alcohol. He had also started getting in trouble with the law. Into his 20s, he had been arrested for theft, assault, car theft, and heroin possession. Jordan had been married twice. Both marriages ended due to his drinking. Besides Jordan's love for alcohol, he also had a high sex drive. Jordan said he drank 50 ounces of vodka daily and had sex with over 200 women per year. Most were sex workers. In 1961, Police officers found Jordan with a five-year-old First Nations girl in his car. He was initially charged with abduction, but he was never convicted. The charges were stayed in May 1961. Later that year, a drunk Jordan stopped traffic as he threatened to jump off the Lions Creek Bridge in Vancouver. He was then held in contempt of court when he gave a Nazi salute during his trial. In 1963, Jordan lured two women into his car to drink. The women accused him of raping and stealing from them. The police arrested him for theft and rape. Jordan was acquitted of rape, but he was convicted of theft. He was sentenced to six months in jail, but his lawyer appealed and he avoided jail time. Jordan could always afford a good lawyer because he was financially secure. 
After his mother died, he smartly invested the inheritance in the stock market. In 1965, a switchboard operator named Ivy Rose Oswald joined Jordan on one of his drinking binges. Oswald was 52 years old. She was from England, with no relatives living in Canada. The next day, Jordan called the police. Oswald was dead. When the police arrived at the hotel, they found her new dead body. Her blood alcohol level was 0.51. To put this into perspective, a person usually blacks out when their blood alcohol level is 0.3. Death from alcohol poisoning usually starts around 0.4. The police took Jordan into custody. The medical examiner ruled Oswald's death as accidental and suspected no foul play. So the police released Jordan. Two months after the death, Gilbert Elsie legally changed his name to Gilbert Jordan. Jordan continued his booze-fueled crimes throughout the late 60s to the early 70s. Police frequently arrested him for drunk driving and various indecent crimes. In 1974, the Crown, which is the prosecution in Canada, tried to have him declared a dangerous offender. In Canada, a dangerous offender is someone who is at high risk to commit violent or sexual offenses in the future. They can be imprisoned for an indefinite period, but the judge decided not to give him that designation. A year later, Jordan took a 47-year-old woman who had the cognitive skills of a 10-year-old from a hostel. Police found her three days later. Jordan had beaten and raped her and stole her diamond ring. He was arrested and charged with kidnapping and sexual intercourse with a feeble-minded person. Jordan was convicted and served 26 months of prison. In April 1976, a court-appointed therapist diagnosed Jordan with antisocial personality disorder. The doctor defined his behavior as, quote, a person whose conduct is maladjusted in terms of social behavior, disregard for the rights of others, which often results in unlawful activities." Unquote. While in prison, Gilbert Jordan learned how to cut hair. After his release, he opened the Soul Cam Barber Shop in downtown Vancouver's East Side. In the 1980s, Jordan would meet women in CD bars and convince them to drink with him. He usually targeted First Nations women. He'd often take the intoxicated woman to a hotel or his barber shop, and then the woman would drink until she passed out. After this, he'd force more alcohol down their throats and rape them before they died. On November 30th, 1980, 42-year-old Mary Johnson died with a blood alcohol level of 0.34. Eleven months later, on September 11th, 1981, 27-year-old Barbara Ann Paul was found dead in a motel room. The medical examiner determined she died from acute alcohol poisoning. She had a blood alcohol level of 0.43. On January 25, 1982, about four months after the last death, 25-year-old Mary Doris Johns died with a 0.76 reading. Just a reminder, fatal alcohol poisoning happens around 0.4. Her body was on a foam mattress in Jordan's barber shop. Nearly a year later, on December 14, 1984, 40-year-old Patricia Thomas was found dead. Toxicology testing revealed she had a blood alcohol level of 0.51. Once again, she was found in Jordan's barber shop. Jordan told the police she had come there with another man, and they drank until they passed out. When he woke up, Thomas was dead. The next to die was 45-year-old Patricia Josephine Andrew. She was killed on June 28, 1985, with an alcohol level nearly double the lethal amount. Her blood alcohol level was 0.79. According to experts, to get that blood alcohol level, she would have had to drink 40 ounces at once. The mother of four's new dead body was found in Jordan's barber shop. He claimed that they had been drinking Chinese cooking wine and then he passed out. When he woke up, she was dead. A year went by, and Gilbert Jordan did not kill anyone. Then, on September 25, 1986, 38-year-old Velma Dora Gibbons was found dead in the hotel 
where she had been living since she separated from her husband. They had split up because of her alcohol abuse. Gibbons was in a different room than the one she had been living in. The cause of death was acute alcohol poisoning. Her blood alcohol level was 0.63. Her husband thought the death was odd. Notably, she had no money on her, but he knew she had just cashed her welfare check. Also, the only alcohol in the room was Chinese cooking wine, and she didn't drink that. But the police did little in the way of investigating. Just two months later, on November 19, 1986, Jordan and his lawyer went to the police station. Jordan told them that 33-year-old Veronica Norman Harry was dead in his hotel room. She had a blood alcohol level of just 0.04. She had cuts and scratches on her face. Jordan was not arrested in the case. All seven of the women were First Nations. The coroner ruled all seven deaths as accidental, despite the extraordinary blood alcohol levels. The police didn't investigate because all the women lived high-risk lifestyles. They were all sex workers who had alcohol use disorders. An alcoholic dying of alcohol poisoning isn't very suspicious. On October 12, 1987, the police received an anonymous tip that a woman was dead in a room at the Maple Arc Hotel. Police found the nude body of 27-year-old Vanessa Lee Buckner inside the hotel room. Buckner was mixed race. One of her parents was black and the other one was white. Buckner was addicted to drugs and occasionally did sex work, but she only drank casually. Her blood alcohol level was an astonishing 0.91 which is 11 times the legal limit. In her hotel room, there were several drinking glasses with fingerprints on them. The police traced the anonymous call and discovered it came from a different room in the same hotel. It was the room Jordan was renting. But once again, nothing was done. Buckner's parents begged the police to investigate the death further. They said that Buckner had given birth two weeks before her death. She was in good spirits. They did not think she would have drunk herself to death. However, the police did not make any arrests in the case. A month later, the police were called to another hotel. The body of 53-year-old Edna Shade, another First Nation woman, had been found. Shade was known as Auntie on the streets. She tried to convince sex workers to return to school. Shade was nude when her body was found. She had died of alcohol poisoning. The police lifted the fingerprints off the vodka bottle and a glass. The prints matched those found at the scene of Vanessa Buckner's death. Since the police knew that the anonymous call to report Buckner's death came from Jordan's room and they had his fingerprints on file from his previous convictions, they compared his fingerprints to the ones they found. They were a match. For 11 days, officers trailed Jordan and watched him as he tried to lure women away from bars. During one interaction, they heard him say, Have a drink, down the hatch, baby. Twenty bucks if you drink it right down. See if you're a real woman. Finish that drink, finish that drink. Down the hatch, hurry, right now. You need another drink. I'll give you fifty bucks if you can take it. I'll give you ten, twenty, fifty dollars, whatever you want. Come on, I want to see you get it all down. You get it down right, I'll give you the fifty bucks and the thirteen bucks. I'll give you fifty bucks. I told you that. If you finish that, I'll give you seventy-five dollars. Finish your drink and I'll give you 20. From November 20th to the 26th, if Jordan got a woman away from the bar, the police stopped her from going into a hotel room with him. But one time, on November 26, 1987, a woman did enter his hotel room. Officers were in the room next to him and they were eavesdropping. They heard the woman gagging. The officers got a passkey and entered the room. They found Jordan on top of the unconscious woman. He was pouring vodka into her mouth. They arrested 55-year-old Gilbert Jordan. Although the police had connected him to the murders of 10 women between 1965 and 1987, he was only charged with seven murders. But by the time he went to trial in October 1988, the murder charges were dropped. Instead, he went to trial for manslaughter in the death of Vanessa Buckner. Jordan showed no remorse during his 1988 trial. In court, he said, they were all on their last legs, 
I didn't give a damn who I was with. I mean, we're all dying sooner or later. Gilbert Jordan was found guilty. The maximum punishment was life imprisonment. Jordan was sentenced to 15 years in prison. He only served six years. In 1994, he was released on day parole. As part of his parole, Jordan was ordered to stay away from alcohol. But he continued to get in trouble. In June 2000, Jordan was charged with sexual assault, assault, negligence causing bodily harm, and administering a noxious substance, which was alcohol. That year, Jordan attempted to change his name to Paul Pierce. At the time, when someone changed their name in British Columbia, they were not required to do a criminal background check or a fingerprinting. Once the authorities realized that Jordan had tried to change his name, they changed the rules around name changes. Jordan spent another 15 months in prison. Over the next three years, Jordan was caught several times with alcohol, or he was seen with intoxicated women. Police would send him back to prison, and then he'd be released. Another part of his probation was that he had to stay on Vancouver Island, British Columbia. In 2004, he was found in Winnipeg, Manitoba, and he was arrested. Gilbert Jordan died on July 7, 2006, at the age of 74. Gilbert Jordan, or the Boozing Barber, as he's known, was Canada's first serial killer to use alcohol as his method for killing. The murders he committed highlighted the poor treatment of First Nations women in Canada. Most of his victims were Indigenous women forced to live on the fringes. Many people believe that had his victims not been First Nations women, he would not have been able to carry on killing. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Please don't forget to check out our new channel, Paranormally Listed. There's a link on the screen now, and there's a link in the description box below this video. Well, that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.